It works like this. This is uh, Lukashevich's story, anyhow. Necessarily P is automatically true if the plane P is true, and automatically false if P is false or neuter. And possibly P is true if P is true or neuter, and false if P is false. Now, this may sound quite right, but it's not so bad if you remember the relation between necessity and time with which I started, and then remember what the three truth values are. A statement is true only if it's a correct account either of something which has already come to pass and so can't any longer not have come to pass, or an account of something which has yet to come to pass but is already bound to do so. So only what is necessary for one reason or the other, either because it has already happened and cannot now be altered, or because it's bound to happen, only what is necessary for one of those two reasons is really true. And a statement is false only if it's an incorrect account, either of something which has already come to pass, and therefore can't now be, as the statement said, or of something which has yet to come to pass, but is bound to do so otherwise than as the statement said. So, only what's impossible for one reason or the other, either because the thing has already turned out otherwise, or because it's bound to do so, only what's impossible for one of those two reasons is really false. Now, this doesn't mean that whatever is possible is true. For although the possible comprises nothing that is false, it does comprise, besides what's true, what is not as yet either false or true. And the fact that the true and the necessary are coextensive doesn't mean that the man who says, my horse is bound to win, is never worse off than the man who says simply, my horse will win. For if the possibility of his horse is winning and the possibility of its not winning are both still open, then the man who says, my horse is bound to win, has said something definitely false, while the man who just says, my horse will win, has indeed said something which is not true, but it's not false either. When looked at in this way, this account of the necessary and the possible is quite attractive. The real difficulties of three-valued logic arise not at that point, but rather when we consider words like and. On ordinary two-valued assumptions, no logical word is more obviously and flatly truth functional than and. But it's very difficult to preserve this truth functional character of and in a three-valued logic. That is, it's very difficult to maintain that whether the compound P and Q is true, false or neuter depends solely on whether its two parts are true, false or neuter. For when the two parts are both of them neuter, we want to say in some cases that the combination of them is neuter also, and in other cases that it's definitely false. Suppose the two parts are these two statements, John will wear a blue tie and James will wear a red handkerchief. And suppose both James and John have still to make up their minds on these matters. We are, in this case, happy enough about saying that the compound statement, John will wear a blue tie and James will wear a red handkerchief, is neuter in truth value, just as its two parts are neuter. But suppose the two parts, instead of being those two, are these two. John will wear a blue tie and John will not wear a blue tie. If John hasn't yet decided whether to wear a blue tie or not, we again have a pair of neuter propositions here. But the combination, John both will and will not wear a blue tie, doesn't seem at all neuter. Most of us would want to rule that out as plain false. And we'd have no qualms in this case about equating the false with the impossible. Now, Wukasiewicz took this dilemma quite squarely by the horns, and he ruled that the three-valued and is truth functional, and that the result of combining two neuter statements by means of and is always another neuter statement, even if it happens to be of the form P and not P. 
In this way, he did give a clear and rigorous formulation to a logical system allowing for a third truth value. But one can't help feeling that he only did it by putting at least one poor word, the word and, to something like forced labour. And I don't think we've yet heard the end of this story. Wilbersiewicz went on from the study of three-valued logic to the elaboration of similar systems involving not merely one, but an indefinite number of truth values in between the usual two. And my own view is that the future of the subject lies more or less in this direction. It also seems to me that the notion of a truth value needs to be broadened. With some sorts of logical calculation, what is important about a statement is not its simple truth or falsity, but when it is true, or in what possible circumstances it would be true. And it's sometimes useful to describe as a truth value uh, the property, for example, of being true until five past six last night and never true thereafter. In this area, as in others, the logician needs to have a nose for analogies. And what's important to him is the set of alternative possibilities that we must reckon with when performing a given sort of calculation. That is what decides whether a system is two-valued or many-valued in the most recent use of these terms. Now, I'll finish with a little bit of history. As long ago as 1885, in the paper in which the idea of calculating with truth values was first sketched, C.S. Peirce wrote this. According to ordinary logic, a proposition is either true or false, and no further distinction is recognized. This is the descriptive conception, as the geometers say. The metric conception would be that every proposition is more or less false, and that the question is one of amount. That's what Peirce said. Truth on such a view as that is zero falsehood. And it might have been better to talk about falsehood values instead of truth values. But Peirce only threw this out in passing as a possible line of development. It was left to Lukasiewicz and his school to make something of it.